Sherry Belcourt, who's a, she's a mm -hmm. Métis painter and she mm. paints with um, these dots that are in a way of like beadwork. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like beadwork as painting. Um, oh. Hello everyone and welcome to today's talk. We will get started momentarily after we give people another minute or so to log in. We thank you very much for joining us. Fantastic. Okay, I see names of many of our common friends. Oh, good. <laughs> it's a big party. So let's give people two more minutes to log in. How's that? Yeah, that's great. Do you have a saguaro cactus behind you? Is that what that is? Uh, I guess so. What <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah. I'm literally living, yeah, I'm, I'm living in a Ming Su, a BNB in a small mm. town right now. Mm. And yeah. um, I've been struggling with the internet for days. So, mm. but, but, they, but, they, but they managed to reset it. So let's oh. hope it works. Okay, okay. Yes. Sure. It's a, it's a lovely place. And honestly, um, this is pandemic time. It's a tourist town, literally mm. nobody. So I am alone living in this <laughs> building. <laughs> you are the sole, sole representative. I know, yeah. I know, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a wild time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see, there is a Q&A. Oh, okay. Somebody said thanking for thank you for presenting, Michael. Great, <laughs> awesome. Okay, we have a we have a sixty attendees that come in already. I think we should get started, and other people will come in um, afterwards. That's fine. So, um, all right. Um, Welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to this uh, event. Uh, my name is uh, Zhang Ling, Ling Zhang. Um, I am an environmental historian um, for uh, China. I'm teaching at Boston College and uh, as the research associate for the Felbank Center for Chinese Studies, I'm convening this research series called Environment in Asia. And this is the ninth year we are doing this series. And uh, for so for those of you, if you are interested in issues related to environmental issues, uh, ecological issues and um, related <laughs> uh, subject matters uh, about China and East Asia in general, please uh, follow us. You can easily find our event on the website for the Center, uh, the Felbank Center for Chinese Studies. And you may also know that we are streaming in this event along, uh, the, along with the other events uh, on the YouTube. So you can look for um, the, the, our events from um, the Felbank Center for Chinese Studies, so the YouTube channel. So um, thank you for coming to join us. So um, today we are um, very lucky to, um, to, uh, to have Michael Hathaway, um, our friend and uh, colleague uh, for uh, studies of China and the environmental issues that I just mentioned. Michael Hathaway is anthropologist in the Department of uh, Sociology and Anthropology um, at Simon Fraser University in Canada. Uh, he is a award-winning author. He wrote his first book, Environmental Winds, um, 
uh, which many of us, I believe, and many of us, the attendees for our event have already uh, read and uh, got inspired by that book. Now, Michael is here to talk to us about his new book, What a Mushroom Lives For. Um, the, the mushroom, Matsutake mushrooms and the worlds they make. So I'm very, very excited about um, today's conversation to learn about this new book. But before I turn to Michael, I have three things um, I want to mention very briefly. So uh, two things to mention and uh, one thing I wanted to show. So the first thing is that today is the Earth Day. And I think this is um, our event is extremely relevant for this particular day. And what is the best the candidate, right? The subject matter mushrooms to talk about when we talk about Earth and Earth and world making, right? The second thing is, I want to say congratulations to our friend Michael Hathaway. Congratulations for winning the Guggenheim Fellowship. What amazing award, and uh, it's a which richly deserved. Congratulations, Michael. Um, and uh, you may have noticed um, in the chat box of uh, this webinar, uh, you must have noticed this message that uh, Mark uh, Grady have sent to us. There is a 30% uh, discount code. Um, if you uh, decided to listen to this talk and get inspired and would like to get a copy of Michael's new book, What a Mushroom Lives For. So please use the code uh, HAT. H uh, H A T thirty for the discount. So the third thing I'd like to mention. Uh, before that, I should have quickly mentioned that this is a webinar formula. So that means we can see you, but you cannot see us. And you cannot see each other's questions and comments. So if you want to share your comments, if you want to raise questions, please type them out in the Q&A box. At the end of the talk, I will function as the voice to read out your questions and comments. So Michael and I both can see them, but I will read them out just for the sake uh, for our audience, the audience will hear the question comments too. So that is how we're going to do it. Um, the third thing, okay, before I turn to Michael, Michael, I read your manuscript and I was so amazed by the very first page. You quote, you quote Neil Gaiman, one of the my favorite authors. <laughs> and I wanted to show this little video clip about right. one minute to share with you. That is a part of the poem you actually quoted. So, um, um, Mark, do you mind um, enabling me um, um, as a host so I can share my screen? Sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. <laughs> Oh, yes, I can do that. All right. So in Michael opens his book by quoting part of the poem called The Mushroom Hunters, which was composed by a renowned author who I love dearly, uh, Neil Gaiman. He wrote this poem for his newborn baby, Ash. And then this poem was read and performed by um, his partner, um, Amanda Palmer, um, um, who is a, performer, a, performing, a performance artist. So here we are gonna listen just to um, uh, how Amanda Palmer performs this part, particular part of the poem that Michael Hathaway quote in his book. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't think you can hear. Yeah, I can't hear it. You can hear the sound. What they observe and serve everything. Can you hear me? And the mushroom hunters will as they walk and watch the world and see what they observe. And some of them would thrive and lick their lips, while others clutched their stomachs and expired. So laws are made and handed down on what is safe. Formulate the tools we make to build our lives, our clothes, our food, our path home. 
All of these things we base on observation, on experiment, on measurement, on truth. Mm. <laughs> so when I um, when I read the first page of your book, I thought about this poem and I found this uh, video and the animation and drawing were particularly made for mm. this poem. So I was really um, touched. So with this uh, imagery and the sound, so I think we are perfectly set in the mood for hunting for mushrooms. <laughs> So here you are, Michael. Yeah. Wow. Thanks so much, Ling. Yeah, that I, I love that poem. And then when I saw the animation and the the way that Amanda Palmer spoke it, it just it blew me away. And it was interesting. I had for the book to get permission from Neil Gaiman to to reprint a little bit more than usual. And he was so gracious and instantly said that that he was in. So that was the real treat for me. So Thanks so much um, to you uh, for the invitation to speak here today and to talk about my new book that will be coming out Tuesday. And also thanks so much to all of you who are here listening from all around the world and to uh, Mark Grady, who's in the background, who's been wonderful to work with in organizing this event. And thanks so much for the kind introduction, Ling. And you're just such a, a force of nature in, uh, <laughs> in doing all these kind of events all the time. And uh, we all so appreciate it. And so I'm glad to be talking to all of you. As, as Ling mentioned, I'm in Vancouver in British Columbia in Canada. And many of you may know that the term Canada uh, comes from indigenous origins, but certainly Vancouver and British Columbia are decidedly not. And I want to acknowledge that I am speaking here today from indigenous territory on lands that were never ceded by treaty with the colonial powers. And this is the land of the Musqueam, the Squamish and the tsleil people. And I'm here today as an uninvited guest on these beautiful lands. And I am slowly learning about the deep histories of the indigenous presence, ancient and ongoing and working with others to educate myself and the public around what it might mean to be a good guest in this place. And so, as Ling mentioned, I was thrilled to be able to speak to you on this day, which is Earth Day. And I really didn't know much about its origins other than I had heard that, you know, yeah, I was born basically a around a month within its first <laughs> origins. And I looked into it a little bit and it turns out that Earth Day was an organizational miracle and happened virtually overnight. It was first proposed by a U.S. Senator in the fall of 1969 in Seattle, and then within half a year, it rolled out. And the first idea was for a, quote, national teach-in on the environment. And this, of course, was inspired by a new strategy at that time to protest the Vietnam War, the teach-ins. And I remember being shown the site of the first teach-in in Ann Arbor, when it was started by the anthropologist Marshall Sollins, when he was a professor at the University of Michigan. And there was talk of a teacher strike against the Vietnam War. And of course, the, the administration was pushing back and you know, criticizing the teachers. And, and Sollins said, well, they say we're neglecting our responsibilities as teachers. Let's show them how responsible we feel. Instead of teaching out, we'll teach in all night long. And so they had their first all night teach in there. And then that just kind of rippled all across uh, the world. And one other just quick thing I would say about this time that's so interesting to me it was such rapid and widespread change. And according to the Environmental Protection Agency, and this statistic seems kind of wildly high, but also possibly plausible, that public opinion polls indicate that a permanent change in national politics followed the Earth Day. When polled uh, a year later, in May 1971, 25% of the US public declared that protecting the environment was an important goal, which from 1969, just two years before, was a 2,500% increase. So just to think about that for a minute. Um, but I think one thing that's interesting is that so many of the themes in, in this are wrapped up in what I'm going to say today about new ways to understand our non-human kin the role of anthropologists in social and political life, and of course, the ways that Asia and North America were so deeply implicated in this case through war. 
Okay. Okay. So now I'll move on to my book. So this book was a, uh, a labor of love. I, I just got one of the, the advanced copies last week. Very excited to see that. And I owe a lot to my larger posse, which is the Matsutake Worlds Research Group. And some of you know that we are a collaborative group of anthropologists who have carried out joint field work in North America, Japan, and China. We, we go out to the woods, we go into the laboratories, we go into the markets and the green grocers, and we talk to uh, amazing people all over. So this group includes Tim Choi, Anna Singh, Shiho Satsuka, Liba Fair, Miyako Inui, and more lately, Elaine Gan. And so we started our fieldwork together in 2004 going to Japan. And there we met the scientists who had dedicated much of their lives to understanding the Matsutake mushroom. And we have been deeply involved in the world of this mushroom ever since that time. And as many as of you know, Anna Singh wrote a beautiful book, The Mushroom at the End of the World. Uh, this book has now been translated into, I believe, nine languages and has been engaged with by so many different people. And that's been very exciting to see. So my own book is the second in the trilogy. And then Shiho Satsuka is working hard on the third book. So my own research on this has been mostly in the high mountains on the edge of the Eastern Himalayas in Southwest China's Yunnan province. And this is a place that I began living in and learning about since I spent my first year there in 1995. But it was, you know, more than a decade later that I really began to delve into this world of this special mushroom. And I found out that it had become the province's most important agricultural export good, although it's you know, as we might talk about, it's not really agricultural, but they sent many millions of dollars of these mushrooms to Japan. And so it became this kind of critical thing for the functioning of that larger uh, provincial economy. And so for those of you in the audience who haven't yet met the Matsutake in person, let me describe it a little bit. It emerges in the fall, but only in very special situations as it requires quite specific species that are often called host trees. In the language of mushroom science, they are called mycorrhizal mushrooms for they form intimate ties with these living plants. And the Matsutake is exchanging the moisture and minerals that it can mine from the earth and giving it to the trees. And then in return, it receives photosynthetic sugars. Perhaps you have also heard that it not only does it exchange food and drink, but these underground connections can sometimes make vast networks, what some call a kind of underground internet or what others have called the wood wide web. And then in this web, there are many forms of communication going on and we just have so much more to learn about this. Uh, this kind of structure, largely invisible structure that has so much effect in shaping the wider world. So we have this mushroom here along the west coast of North America, and it occurs in a sprinkling of places along the east coast as well. Um, when I was out in the east coast uh, one time, Zach uh, Chavez, who's here uh, today, I think he he went and, and showed me a friend of his who had found a Matsutake in the east coast that I was delighted to see. It's mainly white, fleshy, and a robust mushroom, but and it can be confused with others that can look similar, but the thing that makes it so distinctive it's a, is its amazing smell, which is kind of cinnamon-like and spicy at the same time. And there's nothing else like this smell. And there's a, the chemical that makes it has its own particular scientific name. Some people really hate the smell. And so there's a related species in Europe that has a Latin species name of Naziolum that which makes you feel <laughs> nauseous, but others totally love it. And in Japan, there's a lot of Matsutake love, and it's a tradition of writing poetry about this mushroom that goes back more than 1,000 years. And historically, it was reserved only for the elite classes, and hunting Matsutake in the fall was regarded as a delightful activity, something of leisure and pleasure. There's some beautiful paintings showing uh, these groups out doing their picnics and hunting up in the hills. And the world's Matsutake economy is now this major global force and it all centers on Japan. And, but in Japan itself, the mushroom is harder and harder to find. In Japan, there are these high-end grocers which only deal with the domestically 
gathered matsutake, and sometimes the prices can be astronomical, up to $1,000 a pound. And at these grocers, people talk, you know, in, in mournful ways about the, the once famous Matsutake mountains that existed in the area, but where these special mushrooms have completely vanished. Okay, so now that I've told you a bit about the mushroom, I'll give you a brief description of the book, and then I'll read from a few short passages. So the book started in a more conventional way as an anthropologist, and I was planning to have the whole story take place in the heart of Matsutake territory in Yunnan and work with Tibetan and E people who pick them. And that, so I did that, but I was very curious to see how the rise of this profound source of wealth was changing their lives in dramatic ways. And I explored how it worked out differently for people of several generations and genders. But yet one day when I was working with an E mushroom hunter, he told me about how he and his peers engaged with some of the main insect species that I had been looking before as pests. And he told me that they weren't really pests, but they were hunters and that these insects hunted the mushrooms just like they did. He said that these insects were smart, that they learned from what they noticed within their lifetime. And that as much as he tried to trick them by hiding, you know, sometimes small growing matsutakes under some leaf litter, like some leaves and things, or even sometimes using piles of sand, that some of these might be able to learn from other species that hunted not by sight, but by smell. And so for me, this encounter helped to reorient my project. And then I spent a number of years trying to understand what Western science might make of this notion. So in this time, I read a lot of mycology and also studied ideas that did not assume that only humans actively interpreted the world, that only humans actively made conscious choices, what is sometimes referred to by using the term agency. So first I was thinking of insects as agented beings, and then I expanded it to thinking of mushrooms in this way. So in the final outcome, the first half of my book explores how the world might look if we explore the incredible capacities of fungi as a kingdom and how they might have actively shaped the planet's history. And in doing this, I both draw on a lot of scientific studies that fascinated me. And then too, I apply my anthropological training to understand how these scientists, like all of us, are cultural beings, how they use their own assumptions about how the world works and about how this may have affected how they carry out their experiments and how they draw their own conclusions. And then in the second half of the book, I turn to Southwest China, where I show how looking at Tibetan and e engagements with Matsutake looks like when the mushrooms are not just seen as a passive commodity, as a passive resource. And, and here too, I was inspired by an amazing conference that Ling organized many years ago, where we looked, um, to think about other beings, not purely as resources, but to imagine them as having other forms of, of presence. And in, in this way, in, in the book, I was trying to look at what I'm calling their own world-making capacities. So I was asking, how does this change, for example, people's relationships with other key animals and plants that they rely on for food, such as the yak or corn or barley, and so you can see that it turned out into a bit of a different kind of a book than uh, what I had originally intended. So now just grab, a, grab the book and read from a few passages. Okay, so this is from the first half of the book. It's a short section called um, Challenges Within the Current Scientific or, um, Orthodoxy. So when I was exploring the scientific literature, hoping to find lively fungi, I was reminded of a group activity I had engaged in many times with other mycophiles or mushroom lovers. This activity is called a foray, wherein mem members of a mushroom club try to find as many species as possible, whether edible or not, to see which species of fungi are fruiting at a certain time and place. It's kind of like a treasure hunt, an exploration into the unknown, and the participants must have the capacity and readiness to be surprised. Yet in my forays into the scientific literature, I was reading many specialized mycological books and articles and numerous introductory biological textbooks, but I had a hard time discovering any good examples 
of fungi as being lively beings. And I wondered why was this so? So I thought there are a number of challenges and here I would explore two. The first is specific to fungi and relates to how they have been relatively ignored, stigmatized and feared in England, a country that has had since Darwin's rise in the late 19th century, a disproportionately powerful influence in shaping contemporary theories of evolution uh, and in scientific writing more generally. Might, I wondered, this culturally specific attitude play a role in what science emerged? The second is that the biological sciences are structured by a mechanistic framework that tends to work against my interest in understanding the liveliness of fungi. I did, however, find a handful of exceptions to this trend, and I highlight a few examples below. So within the world of mycology, there is a now famous story about an Anglo-American investment banker and a Russian doctor taking a walk in the woods. This event, which sounds like the beginning of a classic joke, turned into a series of events that precipitated the Western fascination with psychedelic mushrooms and expanded interest in fungal powers. And it also revealed the diversity of cultural attitudes towards fungi and particularly strong and specifically British antagonism toward our fellow beings. In 1927, Gordon Wasson noticed that his fiance, Dr. Valencia Gorkin, rushed from the path to exclaim over a cluster of mushrooms that seemed to her like some of her beloved edibles from Russia. Wasson, however, was fearful and refused to eat them. They were puzzled by the stark difference in their attitude. And this event launched their joint lifelong quest to better understand the diversity of human relations with mushrooms. After several years of research, they coined the terms mycophobic and mycophilic to describe two distinct cultural attitudes, mushroom fearing and mushroom loving. They were surprised to note that while many cultures love mushrooms for diverse reasons, Britain stood far on the mycophobic side. And indeed, many assert that the British are the most mycophobic of all the world's known cultures. Since learning about this widespread negative attitude of the British, I've wondered how such mycophobia might have influenced scientific understandings of the role of fungi in the field of ecology. Further, does such a sensibility continue to haunt biological studies? And has it also become embedded in the, in the English language? The possible influence on English is especially important because it is the world's dominant scientific language with 80% of the world's scientific findings published in English these days. And all 50 of the top ranked scientific journals are also written in English. As well, I found that a number of influential biological textbooks in other languages were also translated from the original English. So researchers in British settler colonies, such as Canada, the United States, Australia and New Zealand confirmed that widespread mycophobia remains strong among lay people, which certainly resonates with what I know from my own upbringing. I grew up in an Anglo-American context where few knew much about mushrooms and many felt uneasy about them, certainly too nervous to try eating wild mushrooms at a restaurant, let alone those find, found growing along a trail. And still the origins of British mycophobia are perplexing given that neighboring countries such as France, Italy, and Russia show a great love for mushrooms and mushroom hunting. Now the Wasson's depiction of British mycophobia was not a surprise within the UK itself, where fungi had often been associated with death and rot and referred to as quote, the pariahs of the plant world. Going back to the 1850s, Miles Berkeley was an important explorer of fungal lives and described his fellow citizens' negative attitude towards fungi in this way. And he says, from the, the poisonous qualities, the evanescent nature and the loathsome mass of putrescence presented in the decay of many species, fungi have become a byword among the vulgar and are frequently regarded as fit only to be trodden underfoot. What some people today call mushroom kicking. 30 years later, William Hay, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and a student of mushrooms himself, reconfirmed Berkeley's writings about British attitudes. And, and Hay says, all mushrooms are lumped together in one sweeping condemnation. They are looked upon as vegetable vermin 
only made to be destroyed. No English eye can see their beauties. Their office is unknown, their varieties not regarded. They are hardly allowed a place among nature's lawful children, but are considered something abnormal, worthless, and inexplicable. Now, when British mushrooms were not simply lumped together, they were described into two categories, mushrooms and toadstools. The former term described the edible variety and the latter described poisonous mushrooms, indexing their strange nature and affiliations with other poisonous organisms like toads that had long been associated with witchcraft. And in that same essay, Hoy uh, coined the term fungophobia to describe the fear of toadstools. Now this existing fungophobia was reinforced after it was realized that microscopic fungi created powerful diseases that killed important crops in Europe. Fittingly, as if to reconfirm and extend the existing British mycophobia, the first major breakthrough in discovering fungal diseases took place in the UK. After many years of British colonial expansion into Ireland, much of the population consisted almost entirely on potatoes. The potato blight from 1845 to 1846 caused at least 1 million Irish people to starve and 2 million people to emigrate. And I was surprised to hear that even today, Ireland's population has still not recovered fully from the blight. Eventually, the disease was attributed to a water mold that scientists first saw as fungi. This relationship discovered by Miles Berkeley, who I just mentioned and others, was one of the earliest wake up calls for the power of fungi or what we would now consider fungi like organisms to quickly kill off a large number of plants. And soon this created a trend where most of the studies in both agriculture and in forestry would look at fungi as pathogens, as things to be feared, as, as elements of disease and death. And so the vast majority of this work and of this kind of brain power was directed in that way. And so I began to wonder too, uh, what is the, the origin of thinking about fungi as having possibly beneficial effects and how, how difficult was that to eventually emerge? So I'll, I'll end that uh, first section there. And then from the second half of the book, I will talk about this kind of way of thinking about the interrelations of different species, <clears throat> what I'm calling seasonal timing and about <clears throat> in particular, the yak, the barley and Matsutake. And so here it's up in the Eastern Himalayas um, working um, with Tibetan folks here. So once a family committed itself to harvesting Matsutake, it meant that these entanglements to yaks and barley, and here I'll say that barley is, is uh, grown in, and roasted to make sampa and other goods. It's one of the key uh, plants, both for people to eat the uh, seeds and also as a source of hay for the, uh, the yaks. These relationships were reconfigured and the entry of a new organism changed the family's relation with all the other organisms that they were in deep connection to. Likewise, the exit of an important organism also created important changes. So when some Tibetans sold off their yak herds to devote themselves to finding and to selling matsutake, this meant that their yearly round changed in a drastic way. For some families, this was their first year without yaks within memory of many generations. I'd heard of some cases where family members cried inconsolably when their yaks were sold off and handed over to someone else. I heard of grandmothers who were giving away yaks that were the great, great, maybe even great grandchildren of yaks that they had cared for when they were young children. Because such entanglements require intense and repeated caretaking, and because people and yaks often create emotional bonds, these relationships are special and particular in a certain way. Now, compared to the kinds of relationships between yaks and humans, understanding mutual entanglements between humans and Matsutake is more difficult. We cannot easily see Matsutake changing its own behavior or their own behavior 
in relation to human activity over the long term, let alone in the moment. Here I'll just interject that I was attempting to not refer to Matsutake as an it, but more as a they in the book, but it's really hard to break out of uh, certain habits. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, if we imagine other organisms as having agency only in terms of their reaction to human presence, this is an impoverished notion of agency that, if, that defines it in anthropocentric terms, so only in relation to humans. Instead, if we think of the broad range of world-making activities that the species carries, carries out every day, or at some point in the annual cycle, at a certain point in its life, like mating, then we see a lot that looks like agency, even if these activities don't always reach a particular threshold based on certain notions of intentionality that we often apply to what we think of or what we notice as the agency of non-human beings. So unlike a deer fleeting from the hunter, Matsutake do not hide from the mushroom hunter, even if that is what the people doing the hunting might think when they can't find the mushrooms whose presence they seek. From the perspective of many mushrooms, mammals can be spore vectors, carrying mushrooms' potential progeny to new places that might not be reached by the wind. For many humans, matsutake are food, but few people imagine themselves as vectors. And if we defecate in sewer systems, the chances are low that we will become vectors ourselves. Fruits are one way that plants invite animals to eat their flesh, and most importantly, eat their seeds. Animals become the seeds vector for travel and for fertilizer, what you could call animal friends with benefits. Mushrooms are a fungi's way to spread their spores using the wind or the rain or to be eaten by animals, but we know little about the role that animal transport plays in the life of Matsutake, and I hope we, we learn more. So Matsutake remain elusive, not only to mushroom hunters, but also to scientists that are trying so hard to domesticate them. This elusive quality is one way in which people experience fungal agency. Although so many scientists have worked for so many years and spent millions and millions of dollars in the process, to try to encourage Matsutake to make relations with pine tree and to fruit, to, to, to make the actual above ground mushrooms in the lab or the forest, it seems that Matsutake have always refused. Despite many people's efforts to domesticate Matsutake, to make them reproduce and grow where we desire them to, the proposals for domestication we have made have all been rejected. This is despite humans having learned and provided for the needs of many other edible fungi that we often find at the store from shiitake to portobello to oyster mushrooms. They are the ones that mostly decompose dead matter rather than mycorrhizal relations that I mentioned earlier that form relations to living plants that are far more complex in their relationships. And this is the last paragraph here. Uh, Matsutake's mating season, which is misdescribed in botanical terms as fruiting, as if the mushrooms contain fertile seeds, but what it really is is a form of sporulating or the release of spores, takes place at the same time that Tibetans are bringing their yaks back from summer pasture, harvesting grain and storing hay for the yaks over the winter, as well as gathering animal bedding and collecting firewood. As plants wind down after a vigorous summer of growth, the matsutake burst forth from the forest soil, sending waves of spores into the cooling air. They are hoping to get their potential progeny out into the world before the killing frost sink deeper through the canopy. As the top layer of ground freezes, so do the matsutake. Other mushrooms can withstand a solid freeze like the perennial shelf fungus that grows from the side of trees. But like almost all of the soil-based large mushroom, Matsutake freezes solid and then at some point as the sun warms the air, it turns limp and mushy and returns to the ground. And soon, if you go by later, there is almost no trace of the mushrooms that they were ever there. Matsutake's timing is part of their world making and has a certain rhythm. Hunters slowly attune themselves to this beat 
and to the series of temperatures and rains that might foster the mycelia underground to knit together into a beautiful mushroom that pops up from the earth, filled to the gills of spores, ready to be sent out into the atmosphere. And I will, I will end the section there and I will um, turn it over to Ling to continue the, the conversation. So thanks so much. Thank you, Michael. So beautiful, such a beautiful uh, passages mm -hmm. that you read out. Um, mm -hmm. It made me think so much. For, I, I just, I don't really have a well formulated thoughts, but I just wanted to put down several key words that popped into my mind. And this really reminded me um, in the past that we had an extended conversation. I remember one day just as at AES, literally, right, sitting in the in the hallway at one particular AES, talking behind, you know, beyond the midnight, talking about these issues. So, um, uh, why I am uh, just putting out my random thoughts, which are really just inspired by Michael's talk. I encourage our audience to share your thoughts, your comments. If you have questions, um, just type them out um, into the Q&A function. And then later I will do my best to read them out to the entire group. And Michael will, um, will um, respond and give his answers. So Michael, the, the, what you just read from your book and uh, earlier your comments uh, in the first part, uh, part of your talk really reminded me so many things. So one thing so important is at the end, you talked about the seasonality, the issue of time. And this is the issue, I think, as environmental historian, I'm not anthropologist, I'm an environmental historian, but we, um, uh, we have to grapple with uh, at the same time, you know, how to go beyond the human time to mm. bring in non-human time and even be go beyond organism to look at a non-organisms, different mm. times, how do they in entwine and uh, um, to um, to bring about different worlds, the plural worlds that mm -hmm. you intentionally put down in your writing. So this is so important. I just want to say, I just wanted to, 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 to mention just how important and inspiring this is. And then the second thing is, um, there's a, one part of your talk towards the end when you talked about how scientists and how the global capitalism literally pumped millions and millions of dollars in in order to produce, reproduce mm. this mushroom, which can generate so much value, right? For <laughs> uh, mushroom craving rich people, let's say, <laughs> right? And you, you use these verbs, right? To make them grow, right? To, 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 to cultivate them, to make. And yet the mushrooms, for whatever reasons, they refuse. And I, I just found this kind of a language you use, not only in terms of the actual act, the actual actions that people did, people do, and a mushroom choose to do, but I hear the language that you use in order to um, to frame the story in such a way, right? Not in in a kind of a non-human centric way. I think extremely mm. interesting. So, if it's possible, mm. I would like actually to ask you to talk more about how you actually write the book in such a way in order to um, through the through your own performance, right? Writing as a act, mm -hmm. how to counter the um, conventional norms, human centric, human linguistically, you know, um, our, our norms, um, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the human linguistic regime, how to mm -hmm. battle that. I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I really love this little part you talk about the yaks and how the family had to let it go. And then you talked about these generations of the yaks have been living right with the uh, the human generations. So the entwinement of these particular two, you know, um, entities. If we don't use the species based language, right? Two species. Let's say these two strands of entities: the yak and their the the their their human uh, partners. And how to think about these entwined lineages, even as if this is kind of the two strands of the DNA, right? They're <laughs> deeply entangled with each other. And then there's such um, emotions, affection, and also trauma, right? Because of the loss, as a time change, they have to be broken apart. Mm. Some mm. part of this entangled lineage has to be 
sold had to be taken away. The relationship had to be broken. That、mm. will drive the human partners into tears and perhaps into a lifelong trauma. So I just think this is really beautiful. I don't really have a well formulated thought, but I just think this is so beautiful.、Mm. And、um, and I really want you to tell us a little bit more about your interactions. Honestly. Here is the one thing you told me before a little bit, but I need to. I wanted to know more. Your interactions with the different communities, especially the communities of,、um, you know, scholars such as the scientists, right? And、um, how you work with them and how you interact、uh, interact with them. And I also recall that you talked about your projects. Right, your your project, this particular project with、uh, with a different audiences,、mm. and、uh, there are scientists based audience, a biologist based audience, and you perhaps also talk to uh, maybe um, Chinese scholar based, East Asian scholar based audience. How did they receive your um your your perception, your conception of a project, your effort to go beyond the human based, the human centric,、uh, conventional anthropological research, right? Yeah, tell us more. <laughs> Just yeah, please. Oh, so many great points and questions there. Let me let me just try to start with the most recent one, and then I'll try to work back.、Um, for those of you who don't know Ling, this is this is classic Ling with very so many、uh, great questions and ideas.、Um, So in terms of audiences, yeah, that's so it's so interesting、um, to us to think about, like、um, in terms of giving talks and things like those kind of audiences first. And I remember、uh, realizing that we were coming into like a new social moment when、uh, a group of us gave a talk. This is probably、uh, seven years ago at、uh, at Stanford and. It, the room was really packed, and we were so surprised. And we thought, "Oh, there's a few anthropologists here, but most of these people don't look like anthropologists." <laughs> and we asked around the room, and a lot of them were、uh, materials engineers. And we thought, "Why are why are they possibly coming to hear about this one kind of unusual wild mushroom species that many of them probably never eaten?" And it turned out a number of them had become totally under the spell of mycelia as a material to build with, <laughs> and we had never—I had just heard a little bit about this possibility, especially in terms of、uh, growing the mycelia in a in a base of wood chips or some other kind of medium, and then at which po- point it is killed. And but it becomes like a substitute for styrofoam or building blocks or something like this. And、um, now they're talking about actually keeping it living as a responsive material, which is kind of amazing to reconfigure architecture from that of dead trees into that of living、uh, fungi. But I think that was so interesting for us to realize that.、Um, It wasn't just a bunch of mushroom heads that were interested、uh, <laughs> in this kingdom, but it was spreading across a wide terrain. And、uh, I've had also, in terms of mycologists, I had you know people like Zach who, at an early version of this talk, kind of set me straight on a lot of the different like basic scientific understandings, which you know I'm still new to. I haven't been really formally trained in just trying to understand. The science as best I can as an anthropologist,、um, but and then in terms of this kind of interesting dynamic of thinking about agency, I once had this one mycologist really push back at a talk I gave in Hawaii, and the person said, "Well, you're talking about、uh, fungal agency, Michael, but I really don't get it." He said, "For example, a lot of them are genetically simple, and we can now manipulate their genes, so this shows that humans have control over these, and the mushroom doesn't." Then, and I thought, "Oh, it's such a, it's such a fascinating question and statement about the the very." Like、presumption of kind of what counts as agency, and so it helped me to to think further through it. Just thought like,、oh, there's a few maybe yeasts or other you know fungal organisms that humans can do some genetic manipulation to, but does that mean that 
humans have a hundred percent monopoly on agency and and the fungi have none of you know of all their many millions of species and just to try to think through this um a bit differently um and in terms of like trying to re to rethink the language and to rethink not only in scientific language but in like in our common language there and like how I pointed out I I used the term it this kind of objectifying of of uh fungi when in fact I had wanted to to use things like who and they to really um to put it on a kind of uh like a the same kind of playing field as humans um and other organisms but that it's still just so relentless this kind of language of of keeping it outside of the of the zone of of personhood but but someone of course who i was really influenced by is robin wall kimmer's work and her um specific writing on this language of objectification and distancing and reading those passages really helped me get a different sense and you know she's a potawatomi scientist who is thinking about what potawatomi epistemologies might mean to her work and is also so insightful into thinking about the kind of so deeply embedded paradigms of scientific thinking that kind of separate out humans as an exceptional species that is different in in kind from all others and how that that's uh doesn't even need to be stated explicitly but that's just embedded in in these tiny uh choices we make about language that we don't even think of as choices because they're already presented to us as, as as separate we just follow it and so to try to push against that and to open up another space was a was a really interesting um element of the project for me um and then getting back to the question of the the kind of that that entanglement with with uh yaks and uh, I have a colleague here who talked about the the yaki landscapes of these areas and just thinking about, right, right, that humans are maybe, you know, having this very small amount of agriculture, where which is lands, not that they totally control, but that they manage directly and um, up in these, you know, high elevations, but it's the yaks, these, these, thousands or millions of yaks that are covering this vast terrain through their everyday eating and engagement with the ecosystem that they have made that into a totally different landscape that 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 in in those places the yaks presence is a far bigger um uh aspect in in a direct way than than direct human engagement and so i think it helped the project helped to that kind of rethink a little bit of human hubris, this idea that we have this mastery, this control, and to think about how other species are playing a role. So whether it's the Matsutake kind of refusing to be domesticated, or it's about the, the thousands of years of yak presence and how that shaped uh, the landscapes in such powerful ways. Um, and then you had an other earlier question, but I'll just I'll just leave it yeah. leave it there for now because I think. Right getting some other other questions but yeah exactly those are exactly oh, it's fabulous i really love this a yak landscape idea thousands of years yak presence it's it's a fabulous way to rethink reorient our our views honestly into that particular world right that's beautiful thank you for sharing actually one more right. little thing uh -huh. sure go ahead <laughs> Just that, and this is something through a conversation with you which mm -hmm. was thinking about how rivers become different entities based on the living organisms that are within them, the fungi, mm -hmm. the plants, the animals. I mean, we often think of the fish, mm -hmm. but how are they different in kind because of this, these living presences? How do mm -hmm. they shape the very river itself? And I have a, mm -hmm. a friend who's a sound ecologist who talks about the idea of like putting oh. these little microphones in and, and hearing the distinctive sound signatures that every fish makes, mm -hmm. every species makes as it swims through the water. That these and but mm -hmm. not only the sounds, but that they're active eating and predating and 
you know, their whole life cycle somehow is, is, is shaping the very, and I, uh, I've been haunted mm-hmm. by that, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. that idea for many years now. <laughs> wow. Now you get me haunted. So we have to talk about this, a particular point. I'm really interested. <laughs> All right. Let's turn to, there are quite many questions and comments. So we will do our best to trying to trying to cover as, as many as possible. So how about let's go to the very first one. So first one um, comes from um, Jenna Harris, um, who says, I never realized the Matsutake is also plentiful in Tibetan area of Malias. How very interesting. Thank you for talking about this. I love to be connected to lands and areas I admire. Fungi, let me be part of learning about certain lands. I will need to get your book. Great. <laughs> usual, usual talk about Matsutake is about Japan. Great. Fantastic. Thank you, Jenna Harris. So, Michael, you just get one reader here, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, Would you like to say a little more about this? Sure. I mean, one thing that's really interesting is that some people wonder about its its history, the, the history of Matsutake in this area. And the one person who I've ever seen write about this, and this is just in one sentence, was a um, Daniel Winkler, who's a, 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 a expert on many things, fungal, especially cordyceps. That, that's, that, that's that amazing um, kind of zombie caterpillar that's infected by a, uh, a fungi. But um, so there is a little bit of talk of the older history, but a lot of the of of engagement with Matsutake, but a lot of people said it was something that wasn't really that important to them. It wasn't really a a priority mushroom. And up there, people eat a lot of different mushrooms. Um, And, you know, it's not it's not something that grows up out in the grasslands. It's something that's growing in the piney. Um, areas uh, in the forested areas, the Matsutake, but it's only in the last, you know, few decades really since the 80s that it's become a big thing. So it's interesting, like compared to cordyceps, that, you know, that fungal insect relation, that history goes back centuries and centuries. And it's part of this whole, you know, uh, before more of a Tibetan focused medicine and now used by so many people all around the world, whereas Matsutake is so, so recent. And um, it's something that, um, though that now really uh, has created um, both a lot of conflict as people like Emily Ye have uh, talked about between the different villages that have a lot of Matsutake and those that don't nearby. Um, it grows in a very, a uh, heterogeneous way, um, but it's it's a new player in, in an important way, but it's having such a major, major effect. So thank you. Great. Okay, we will turn to a anonymous attendee. I think the next two lines are, are both from this attendee. So this person says, I collect lots of East Coast mats. In a mats in Maine, uh, the main <laughs> Maine. Sometimes I found them by smell. Last mm. year was an extraordinary year. I found them in fairy rains where previously I only found a few. I mm. thought they were not the same species as the Japanese one. And also, I think the same person says curious refreezing. Here they are the very last one to bloom and seem to tolerate and even require some frost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, and the, so they, yeah, sometimes they're called Matsis, like it's kind of the cute name for Matsutake. And, Uh, uh and then it's interesting too, to think about the magic of them, how they are, you know, and when they're growing in that circle, that's, you know, this European terminology of the, of the fairy ring, like the idea that the fairies are the ones bringing them up out of the soil. Mm-hmm. And that one thing I like about that, um, the uh, comment is that it shows too, that their incredible responsiveness and plasticity so that sometimes they'll just pop up a few and depending on the rains and the temperature, they often do need some kind of frost in a way to trigger them or some kind of soil temperature. And it's something that in Japan that you have these farmers up in the hills who have all of these underground thermometers and they're making these very careful records of the 
of the matsutake fruiting with temperatures and really trying to figure out these relations, but that still remain a bit enigmatic, like we can't really predict it well. And then sometimes there'll be a year with almost nothing will come up. And then the next year it'll just be total bonanza. And so that's one of the other interesting things about it in terms of like trying to industrialize them to make them predictable, to make them, you know, consistent and all of these things. But uh, Matsutake's relationality to not only like the trees that has to be there already, but to these really divergent uh, rainfall patterns and temperature regimes will will really affect how they how they emerge. And I and I love that too that they can find them by the smell and I'm really jealous because I, I, I can smell them up close, but, but, uh, Anna Singh is a, a very attuned to the smell. And, and I, I talked about a, um, so sometimes she can smell them before she sees them. And I talked about a friend who would, she would find the mycelia growing and you can find the mycelia because it will, if you know a patch there, or there's this one kind of uh, parasite, uh, organism that parasites only on Matsutake mycelia. And if so, if you find this, this organism, you can go underneath and, and pull back the ground and smell it. And that will give you a kind of a, like a search image equivalent of smell. And then, so it'll kind of attune your nose to the smell. And so some people are lucky enough to be able to wander through the woods and use their nose to, uh, to locate them. So. Right. Wow. This is so amazing. So not only time, not only um, um, uh, the temperature, but also smell, all mm. these are different kinds of associations. And I love at the beginning when you mentioned the Matsu, Matsu, um, Matsutake, the, the, these nicknames in a sense here, obviously there, this is a kind of insider's a unique <laughs> vocabulary, right? Which isn't shared by the communities and not to but not the people or whatever um, the, the beings outside that community. So this is a secret language <laughs> and I really like that. <laughs> okay, let's go to, um, yeah, your friend, Zach Chavis, I think this is the, your friend that you mentioned many times, uh, who says, I notice you use the term yaks, where is a Dan Winkler, who you also mentioned, another ethnomycologist who has worked with the Tibetan uh, likes to name these explicitly as a yak cow hybrids. Can you speak to why you favor the term yaks? <laughs> sure. I just I just use the term yak here for its more easy general audience uh, reception. But Zach is totally right that it's interesting down around where I'm uh, doing most of my field work there, it's a lower elevation. And so the yaks are interbred with cows and that helps make them um, produce more milk. But what's one of the things that's really interesting about uh, the yaks is that they are so intertwined with these high elevations that they cannot really thrive at lower elevations. And I was really interested just to think of, usually I imagine it the other way. There are a lot of species that can only go so high. And especially in the plant world, there are these upper limits to where plants can survive. But for yaks, 4,000 meters, no problem. You know, they are up there. And as they as they go down, they start to suffer. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, it's, it's another way too, in which they are so deeply entangled with that land and what we call a lack of oxygen, <laughs> the uh, mm -hmm. yaks actually relish. Um, and just one more little thing on um, yaks, because you were asking about that earlier. It's, it's interesting where I first did research along um, the tropical rainforest along the Mekong River uh, there, the people were starting to get rid of their water buffalo and they were replacing them with these small handheld tractors. And the grandfather where I lived, he talked about, um, he was saying, oh, Michael, this is so uh, sad for me because I knew the 101 diseases, and this is more of a metaphorical expression, but of, of the water buffalo. I knew how to diagnose them. I knew the right, what plants, what herbal medicine to do to, 
to care for them. He said, and now I don't know a single thing about how to fix these retractors. <laughs> this is something for the younger generation. But so it's really, it's been um, interesting and to see these like to be there at the moments of these transformations of relationships that had been established for centuries mm -hmm. or millennia. Mm -hmm. And I had honestly never really thought about the idea that, um, you know, people raising these animals, of course, would have this knowledge that I thought of as more veterinary knowledge, like that of separate experts, mm -hmm. but, you know, the same kind of thing as a water buffaloes for the yaks and people knowing what kinds of foods they love and and don't love and, and how to notice um, things about them. And so it's it's like in the um, the poem, the, uh, the Neil Gaiman poem around observation. And so it's this kind of keenness of observation um, that really interested me that I feel like a lot of times we aren't as, um, you know, we aren't as reliant on distinguishing between the, the eating the species of mushroom that kills us or the ones that make us feel healthy. Um, and so it's also paying attention to other, other organ, other organisms like the water buffalo and the yaks and, and what they need to thrive in the world. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to really quickly pick up one thing that you mentioned earlier, actually related to what you just said here. That's the thing when you, um, when you, you want, you, you wanted to replace the word, the pronoun it with a they. <laughs> And because in most cases, as you are talking about, you are not. We're not talking about kind of enlightenment, enlightenment ideal of uh, individual beings, right? Um, uh, as the individual agency carrying entity, but we are talking about community based. We're talking about lineage based. And for instance, around the water buffalo, you have this entire knowledge system, which is populated by generations of a human being and the other species around. So. So by displacing water buffalo, one particular water buffalo, you're displaying this entire community that generates and sustain this knowledge system and the relationships. So they is a really proper pronoun for all <laughs> the this sort of world making and world crushing or collapsing experiences. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate why you wanted to use they. I'm sorry that you failed the fight i hate to say you failed the fight for for that pronoun <laughs> well sometimes like actually the uh, the editors were were happy with it in some ways uh, but i failed as an individual to always uh, remember to do so being so trained into it and nobody else so as you know caught it in reading so it's it's just interesting too where just that that deep embeddedness uh just sets us so uh, so far in a way that we often cannot see um, to orient the world in a particular way, mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. All right, let's move on. I think our ne the next question asks you to share some pictures, and I oh. think maybe we can we can either leave it to the very end. So because I, I would like us to cover uh, the other questions as many as we can, and uh, if it's possible at the end of the uh, our conversation, maybe you can look for a few pictures to share with. So um, if that's okay, let's quickly move to. Um, the other question, the next question. So I, I can tell Michael is looking for pictures right now. So I can read out the next question, uh, which is uh, which comes from Hai Ren, uh, who says, Michael, thank you for, um, oh, here. All right, everybody. So for those of you, if you are interested in looking at the pictures, um, any uh, multimedia representation of Michael's uh, book, here is a uh, link to his personal website. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So hi and ask Michael, um, um, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Looking forward to reading your book and using it in my Anthropology of China course in the fall. Fantastic. Can you discuss your methodology? Specifically, did the research require you to collaborate with non-anthropologists, for, insta for instance, scientists and artists? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Thanks so much. Um, Yes, it did. Um, it so it's interesting because, like, right, we usually think of the anthropology 
field work as being, you know, you often go to a certain site and work with those, you know, local people within, within that realm. And, but ours was part of this multi, multi-sided uh, ethnography. And so we spent a lot of time with uh, Chinese scientists, with Japanese scientists, uh, with American and Canadian scientists. And in part, they would teach us about this science, but also we were part of conversations, you know, as anthropologists trying to also, you know, look at their own work anthropologically, like I mentioned um, a little bit. So I was so interested in that. And since the, you know, that the time I mentioned 2004, and we were meeting in Japan with one of like the biggest experts on Matsutake in the world and 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 he and we said oh and we can't wait to see you know your incredible personal archive of decades of research and material and then he looked at us he said oh you guys should have got here just just the other day i i threw away everything all my papers thousands of papers and we were (laughs) just so shocked but he was saying that yeah he felt like that the um the Matsutake had such a hold on his life. He actually needed some, some space and some breathing room from that. And he had gotten rid of everything. And it was, so it's kind of like a tragedy to us, but now it's also something that we realize like how it infuses, uh, you know, kind of every day's being um, in this way, but we got to meet with a number of his colleagues who worked in the laboratories. And then we went out to the field. So it turns out there are these field experimental sites all through Japan and then we were uh, part of uh, an organizing committee to create the first um, uh, scientific conference between scientists from North Korea and from China and Japan that all got together in, in China. Um, and so that was a really fascinating um, workshop to be part of where everything was uh, translated and Uh, brought together that became part of our work, but we have really haven't, there's so much more that we've done that we haven't written about, but that that was very influential. And then uh, Shiho Satsuka and Anna Singh wrote this brilliant paper comparing um, some of the science that was produced in Japan compared to that that was done in North America by looking at how they had fundamentally different understandings of nature and humans role in nature that ended up generating different kinds of experiments in Japan compared to in North America. And later I heard from some of these scientists, they said, oh, they were so fascinated to actually read this. And and, uh, some of them said, we felt like there was something different going on when we were speaking together, but we never really thought about it as something of epistemology. And so that was that was really interesting. So like trying to, to dig into, you know, some of the presumptions. And like I mentioned a little bit today against that kind of very particularly British antagonism um, towards mushrooms. And, you know, I don't have it all figured out. It's still like a very open question about uh, the role of these histories and how this shapes the present, but certainly this kind of pathogenic bias, this kind of way of, of, of assuming their, um, their threatening nature to our crop species or to our, whether they are plant, whether they are annual plants like rice or wheat or corn, or whether they are trees, there's often been a, a very deep sense of um, fear and antagonism uh, towards them that, that, I, that I hope will become more balanced over time, a more ecological view will emerge. Thank you for really in thoughtful answer. All right, let's move on to the next question coming from uh, Xu Shan Zhang, who says, hello, Professor, my question is, as, as anthropologist, what do you think of a drawing on scientific research that's related to your previous answer to develop your writing? Do you think it's an advantage for anthro- um, uh, uh, anthropology, uh, anthology, or retreat into a recourse to science? Thank you. By the way, I'm a PhD candidate in science and technology studies from Tsinghua University in China. I'm really looking forward to reading the new book. Oh, thanks. That's great. So this person already is, yeah, deeply in the STS science and technology studies world. And 
for me, when I was a, a graduate student um, at, at Michigan, I had this amazing class by Sharon Stevens. It was one of her last classes before she died, but it was the anthropology of science. And it really opened my eyes to uh, this way of understanding scientific uh, practice, uh, thinking, writing um, in an anthropological way. And we were, um, of course, very interested in, in works uh, by people like Emily Martin and Sharon Terweek uh, and others that, that really kind of started me down this path. And, and that's a good question and a good possible warning about um, what, it, what does it represent? What are the different ways to do this? And, and I do think that uh, I do want to remain skeptical of just using um, uh, scientific claims uh, just in and of themselves, uh, uh, assuming their total truth value. And I think we need to be um, careful uh, with that, especially as, as anthropologists. Um, but on the other hand, one can't make um, an anthropological aside with every uh, single statement. So um, it is, it's also a challenge in writing about this uh, uh, in a, uh, in a way that really engages science. And I'm trying to move beyond just a critique of science that some, that has been a dominant part of some veins of, of the kind of anthropological STS work. Um, but, uh, but to have more of a conversation and engagement. And so part of the book um, also explores what kind of creative interventions are being done um, by various scientists. And it's something actually I want to work on um, later as well. And, you know, find the, the, the scientists who are um, also really interested in a kind of lively understanding of organisms in, in a, that aren't so um, afraid exactly of anthropomorphism, which is a, a, a big thing that scientists try to be really careful about. But I think actually a lot of times what is called anthropomorphism is not. Um, and we can talk about that later, but um, but I do think it's a uh, it's a it's a risky but worthwhile endeavor to engage as anthropologists with science. Oh, and I just noticed, Ling, that I just wrote the uh, the link to my website that has all the photos. I think it's only sent to the host and panelists. Oh. So. Sure. If somebody could send that out to everybody, that would be great. Okay, let me send here. So okay. everybody has it okay. now. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to push you a little bit here. So it's a called anthropomorphism, but it's a not then. <laughs> Say something. <laughs> Say more. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I, I want to um, learn. I want to learn. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So, um, so anthropomorphism, as you know, right, is, is a very taboo uh, term in scientific practice. Uh, and so uh, a lot of times people say, oh, I will, I will use this term, but I don't want to be anthropomorphic um, or to, you know, imbue other organisms with a set of assumptions that usually pertain to, um, to humans. And so, for example, saying, um, talking about you know, the jealousy between two different animals would be often considered anthropomorphic. But what, uh, because sometimes we assume that jealousy is a human only emotion, that other species cannot feel jealousy. And that may be or may not be true. And I wouldn't challenge that one. But what I do see a lot is that uh, people talk about um, fearing anthropomorphism of for different things that are not specific to humans, that they are sometimes being um, animal morphic, which is not really a term so much, but in terms of thinking about how plants and fungi um, behave in the world. And so we often create this uh, categorical difference between how we think of animals behaving in the world compared to plants and animals. And, or, sorry, compared to animals. And so there's even pushback that um, plants do not have behavior 
by, by plant scientists, which I find really fascinating because often the way that we define behavior is in an animal centric modality. And so I was really influenced by um, some people like um, uh, the book, uh, What a Plant Knows, and where he talked about how to think about senses and how to think about like seeing the world or smelling the world or engaging the world uh, in ways that goes beyond a a human-based model or even an animal-based model, but how to think about how plants themselves may have certain capacities. So if we define seeing as based on an eye, then we have always limited that question to only those organisms that have what we call eyes. But if we think about seeing in terms of a visual perceiving in a different way, then we can open it up to a much bigger repertoire of beings. And so I think that there are these uh, deep tendencies towards like a kind of animal centrism and that sometimes when we uh, become fearful of, of anthropomorphism, that actually we need to think carefully is what we're saying is very specific to only humans or is this part of a wider thing? Because um, there are often wider capacities. I mean, humans share so many other, capa- so many capacities in so many ways of being with our fellow mammals and with many other animals. So it's, uh, I think we've, um, been kind of trapped in some ways by um, this kind of fear that uh, of of avoiding anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism that has had really deep effects on um, stymieing a lot of possibly really interesting scientific work. Mm-hmm. 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 This is really um, insightful. Um, great. I, I well, I would like to hear more, but but let's <laughs> leave our conversation to the future. So I'm so just get so excited. You got me thinking. Let's move on to our next question. And I think um, be, I'm going to skip the next two questions or, or or put them um later because I think we heard some questions from these two uh, um uh, from the audience. So we will just put them later. So let's jump to the question by our friend. Um, Brendan, uh, Brendan Gallopol. So he says, thanks for the, this delightful presentation, Michael. Can't wait to read the book, which I'm, I, I'm sure will now need to be edited and cited in mine um, in progress um, on Tibetan in Yunnan. So um, on that note, you mentioned about the abandonment and the selling of yaks in exchange for much tech economy. And I've seen the same thing happening with the Tibetan farmers here, both the selling of yaks and also abandoning barley, wheat, buckwheat, uh, corn, et cetera, to monocrop wine grapes. We've also talked about this with a water buffalo before. So I'm wondering if you think these transformations are representative of a broader reconfiguration of a species relations in rural China, Hmm. perhaps in these particular ethnic minority regions with a quite complex uh, agroecological and human ecology processes developed over generations as you mentioned. What does the future look like here to you under these new world making regimes of matsutake, wine, mm. caterpillar, fungus, et cetera? Oh, thanks so much, Brendan, for that. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of dizzying world in this way. And I certainly too, I, it's just a good reminder. I don't want to um, you know, pin all the agency on yak, uh, people selling off their yak herds to matsutake. There's a There are many, many reasons why this is happening. This is happening not only in China too, but throughout the larger um, Himalayan plateau um, in in many places. And so I think too, we need to be careful for for jumping to a a kind of universal reason for what's happening because there may be really different reasons for different groups in different places uh, for this. So that will be interesting. And then there may even be places, right, where there's increasing numbers of yak herds. There may be, you know, where there's part of like a touristic uh, yak meat economy that is being um, brought up. But this, 
the whole way of looking at these species assemblages in motion and the way to, to think about how the particular, I'm really interested in the ways the particular needs of the organisms themselves, uh, both in terms of the, the kind of land they need, the kinds of either nutrients for plants or the diseases that they're susceptible to. And like, I was very interested to see too, like for barley up in these regions, uh, one of the main diseases is caused by a fungus <laughs> there. So people are both like building this incredible fungal wealth up through the caterpillar fungus, through Matsutake, through a handful of others sometimes. But uh, fungus is like one of the main elements that can, you know, wreak total disaster upon uh, the crops too. So uh, looking at these two in the way of the organisms and people's entanglement, but, but both as world makers, I think is, is really interesting to me, kind of moving away from a, these are just passive things that become easy commodities, easy resources, or pre-existing resources really, um, as a much, I think, opens up a whole new set of, uh, of questions and a whole new set of, uh, of concern, so I'm exciting. I'm excited to see this this kind of perspective flourish, and there's so much more to be done. On this. Thanks. Fabulous. Um, we have a precious three minutes left, <laughs> and I think we still have many questions. So, so I'm going to just quickly jump to the the Jerry Z's question because I think that several other questions are asked by people who already raised their hand before. So let's just try to manage to finish the the the, the answer to Jerry's question. So Jerry asks, assess. Thanks, Lena and Michael. I have a question about how the extensive world-making entanglements of matsutake and other mushrooms might help us think the relation um, between living and dead, mat dead matter. It strikes me that so much of the materialism discussion in the last couple of decades equates agency with quote, quote, liveliness, um, if not a liveness or animacy as a battle Vitalism, but um, vitalism. I'm struck by your description of mushrooms and not only their support of life, but their relation to dead matter. Can you help us thinking about this? This is an awesome question. Yes, yeah, dead totally mushrooms is. kill. Very, very Jerry question. So fantastic. Um, yeah, and I mean. And, that gets it to the heart of one of my big puzzles, like early on in the work where I was going to try to take on <laughs> in part this relationship of what we call living to what we call dead. And I think it's interesting too, to sometimes just step back from it and not just assume it's an always already existing category that is definable and neat and pre-existing. And that's something I would, um, a tribute uh, to my uh, wonderful colleague, uh, Kim Tallbear, who has a lot of interesting things to say about the recent kind of STS turn in thinking about animacy and how much it owes to a long history of indigenous intellectuals and, and scholars and pointing out that this kind of line between the living and the dead is far more uh, complex and nuanced and uh, rich than we may tend to think. And so um, I am, I, I really love how Jerry points out that these kind of the verbs that we use kind of rely on this idea of the living. And I'm really fascinated by like the Matsutake's utter reliance on the things that we call dead, um, like these minerals underground that it can somehow like drill through and mine and absorb and really curious about how sometimes these minerals are actually, you know, the graveyards of the once living, like the limestone that was once these kind of marine organisms that build up, but then they have new layers of engagement with, with other living beings uh, later on. So something certainly very rich to, uh, to think about. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So can I quickly add just a, a couple of sentences in relation to this issue that uh, life given and a life killing uh, the, these capacities of these organic and non-organic matters. So, uh, so this remind me partly because as you know, I'm uh, my partner works on religion. So I constantly think about these issues and I think you open um, your talk for the first part of the book when you read about the um, micro uh, micro it's micro uh, phobia for instance in England <laughs> yeah. a lot of that is associated with the religious beliefs and I mm. think in Mm. Uh, as a Ch Chinese historian, right, in the context of the China, mushroom plays a specific roles. And uh, for instance, in Taoist practice, you always have mm. these beliefs that certain mushroom are magical mushrooms. Mm. And I actually, last week when I was doing my field work, I saw one. I don't believe that's a real one, but one local scholar pointed out to this huge, gigantic dry, dry mushroom telling me this is the most magical mushroom that he collected in his personal collection. I think that's a fake, but anyway, people believe in that. Um, so the magic mushroom, right? And when you talk about minerals, right? Cinnabars, all these um, stuff were used partly sometimes as a, um, as a, as a medicine for for healing and a lot and also other times are used if you um, use excessive dosage right you can mm -hmm. use them for 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 the purpose of the killing so yeah. the the boundary between life and death the boundary between healing and the killing seems yes. extremely blurry and according to based on what i know from your research right this boundary cannot be easily grappled with it cannot be well controlled and a mm. lot of times things go beyond your um, <laughs> anticipation right <laughs> so go beyond the control just like a mushroom refuse to grow right mm. for the purpose of nourishing human um appetites so um so yeah so this is just um what you make me think mm. so with this line, I would like to express my gratitude to you, Michael. Thank you so much for your um, wonderful uh, this talk and uh, extremely insightful and ex inspiring conversation with us. I personally, and I believe all our audience, um, have benefited greatly for this com from this conversation. Thank you for being here. And I look mm. forward to finishing reading your book. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks so much. It was fantastic, as always, to talk to you and to have everybody uh, tune in. I really appreciate it and love the questions. So, right. love. And everybody, uh, uh, especially several of you, um, there's several questions so we don't have enough time to cover. So I've copy paste all oh. of them into the chat box. So for those of you, if you take, you're interested, you can take a look. And I believe Michael um, can be reached by his email. You can easily find him out <laughs> by Googling his name. And so if you have questions and comments, contact him directly and certainly get a copy of his book and uh, and read it and even teach it so i've i've read i haven't finished reading it but i've done about two thirds extremely um and uh, beautiful it's beautifully written so everybody should read it mm. all right all right so thanks. with this note uh thank you everybody for being here uh happy earth day and um um, enjoy mushroom hunting and uh, enjoy alternative world making in your own life. Thank you for being here. <laughs>